all praises to our Father in heaven for all that he does. Look in here at the Shepherd of Hermas, translated by William Wake. We're up here in Similitude 9, looking at verse 161. See, he's going to start to tell them who these 12 mountains are. And so we're going to define those. In verse 162, he's going to tell you how everybody is a part of these mountains. We're going to learn how each of us fit into one of these 12 mountains and how they are different, giving some, you know, ideas on even why they're different and how it is that they will become better. In this part, we're going to touch on what the seal is in verse about 167. One thing I'd ask you to think about as we're going through is, is this seal, could it possibly be the um, slick lime and shells that was used to smooth out the faults? In this section, we're going to talk on who's going to be saved and who's not, who has a chance and who ain't even got a shot. This one is going to be a deep one. Go ahead and hit that like button or leave a comment to let us know you's here. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Abba, we come to you today, Lord, asking that you will impart wisdom on us so that we can understand what we are uh, teaching out of the Shepherd of Hermas and we can convey your messages to your children. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. And so be it. Hey, y'all. We're up here on verse 161. You ready? Mm-hmm. All right. We'll go ahead. We'll write down hook words as we go. 161. I answered, Sir, tell me now what concern those mountains. Why are they so different, some of one form and some of another? All right, so the tower is now completed, and he's starting to explain all of the other details of this parable to Hermes. Remember, this is a huge parable. You have to go back to all of the similitudes. There's a lot to this, to this tower, and he's going to start to explain the mountains here. Okay, 162. Here said he, These twelve mountains which thou seest are twelve nations which make up the whole world. Wherefore the Son of God is preached to them by those whom he sent unto them. Alright, now, this part, we, we plan on going through this pretty quickly, faster than we did in the last two sections. But we do want to stop in this, in this part right here, this particular verse right here, because it's extremely important to the understanding of this parable. Right? He's, tell, he, he's telling him who the 12 mountains are. And what does he say here? They are the 12 nations, mm -hmm. who, which make up the whole world. Right. So, he, wherefore, the Son of God is preached to them by those who he sent unto them. And by nations, what, is, what do we mean by nations? Um, you know, because a lot of people think nations are races. Right. But um, no, this is not. This is this is talking about all of the different people groups. Um, um, uh, for you, instance, um, Americans. Um, let's look up the word nation and see what comes up. All right, so look, look in here at Google. We're going to define the word nation. It says, a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhibiting a particular country or territory. Okay. All right, so now when we, when we put this in context to the scripture, when it's talking about a particular country or territory, it's talking about the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So the 12 nations are the people groups that make up the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Now you look down here, it says a large body of people united in common descent or history or culture or language. So in our case, it's the scripture that we're united in or the law or the Bible or faith in the Father that okay. we're united. Okay. Not right. necessarily like Americans, Arabs, uh, Chinese. It's not talking about that. No, not at all. It's, yeah, you're right. It's not talking about those at all. Okay. So, and, I, and I've thought this for a long time, is that the the world is kind of broken up into 12 different types of individuals. Mm -hmm. If you take everybody in the world and you, you can separate and put them into 12 different groups of people. I think that's why there were 12 apostles 
What else? I think that's why there were 12 uh, patriarchs. The number 12 is used a lot. I, that was going to be my next question, which I don't want to get off, you know, this question. But my next question was going to be what was the significance of 12? Because we see it in virgins. We see it in the um, the harlot women. Um, there's 12 churches, I think, in Revelation. Is no, there's Revelation? seven seven churches seven in churches. Revelations. Okay. There, there, there is actually twelve of them, but the other five are not really mentioned. Okay. He doesn't right. mention the blasphemous ones in there at all. He's okay. basically just talking to the ones that, that you know, have a chance for survival. But there are twelve churches. There will be twelve churches. So what do you, what um. Twelve. So you saying months. that the yeah twelve months of the Gregorian calendar? I don't know if about the Hebrew calendar. Yeah, they're actually twelve months of the Hebrew calendar. The the. the 12 is a number of completion. That's why you'll see that number so common. But you were saying that there are 12 groups of people I believe that, that make up the entire world. Right. I believe that you can take all 7 billion people and parse them out and separate them into 12 different kinds of people. Okay. Spiritually, I believe we have 12 groups of spirits, each of which can fall into one of these mountain types. Right. All right, so let's go on, because he's going to continue to explain it. 163, but why, said I, are they different, and every one of a figure? He replied, hearken, those 12 nations which possess the whole world are 12 people. All right, the whole, like he, he's confirming what I said here, and this may be where I got this idea from. Um, he's saying that the whole world is, is of these 12 different kinds of people. Okay. And as thou hast beheld these mountains different, so are they. I will therefore open to thee the meaning and actions of every mountain. So he's going to start to explain who they are. Okay, this should be interesting because, you know, as you said and as the scripture backs it up, these we're about to see the 12 different kinds of people um, that makes up the whole world. Okay, so these 12 different types of people. You say, well, they would include the atheists. We're going to find out. They're going to include the believers. They're going to, uh, the saints, the, they, and everybody in between. The thing is, they have various understandings, and that's what puts them on different mountains. That's what makes them different, is their understanding of the scripture, or their adherence to the scripture, or their obedience, or something like that. Okay. 165. But first, sir, said I, show me this. Seeing these mountains are so different, how have they agreed into the building of this tower and been bought to one color and are no less bright than those that came out of the deep? Right, so because you remember some of these mountains are black, some of them are chipped, some of them are uh, maimed and cracked and, you know, all different kinds. And, but once they enter into the tower, they're all going to be uh, white. They're all going to be square. They're all going to be clean. They're not going to have any cracks or chips in them at all. And the Hermes is, is wondering how does this happen. He's wondering how can they, once they enter into the tower, be the same as uh, Noah and mm. Jacob and Moses. The ones yeah. that are already in the tower, right? Mm -hmm. 166. Because, replied he... All the nations which are under heaven have heard and believed in the same one name of the Son of God by whom they are called. That's how they end up being in the tower. Okay, They started off being rough and, and of different kinds of stones. But once they believe in the name of the Son of God in whom they are called, then they are fitted for the tower. But you, you have to remember that believing in his name also requires the... the um, the clothing of the 12 virtues. Yeah, yeah. Just believing. Uh, when we say that they believed in his name, we're not just talking about, you know, standing up and saying, yeah, I believe in in Yehoshua HaMashiach and, you know, go on and do whatever. There's uh, ex acceptance and action and taking on all the 12 versions before, you know, we just don't want to say believe. believing is mere you know, just actually saying the word, I believe. He's not talking about that. That's why the New Testament says faith without works is dead. Right. You right. Action. Yeah. And the actions include adherence to the law, 
adherence to the commands, the mandates, and such. It's, there's work involved in this thing, and if we have not that work, then, you know, our faith is going to be of naught. It's not going to do us any good. Yeah, you know, that's just so important because we've always used that as some kind of, the church has always, and people has always used that as like a self-motivation motivation, uh, uh, proverb. Faith without works is dead. You know, you want to get that job, but you got to do something, you know. You got to get out there and present that resume. You got to get out there and, and, and work that job as if, you know, you're doing a real job. If you want to get it, you got to, you know, stay on it 24-7 and all that kind of stuff. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about... Uh, works of charity. Yeah. Works of love. Works of patience. Mm -hmm. Works uh, of uh, faith Continence, itself. Yeah. Right? Uh, yes, those kind of works. Mm -hmm. But it, are, is he talking about that also? Could that be talking about that? Well, or? that's a little bit polluted when they say that because those are the same people that will go and say, you know, blessed is the child that has his own right. and the father, you know, takes care of those who take care of himself and those kind of things. So they're saying, you know, they, they use that and they say stuff like, you know, you can pray for the father to give you uh, the, the, uh, the, the food, clothing and shelter that you need, that you need or desire. But you really gonna have to get up and go get a job yeah. and get it. Yeah. So they're polluting yeah. it a little bit. Okay. One sixty seven. Wherefore, having received his seal, they have all been made partakers of the same understanding and knowledge, and their faith and charity have been the same. And they have carried the spirit of these virgins together with his name. Now, there's something I wanted to bring out here, you know, before, and I may, we're going to come back to that verse. But while I'm thinking of it, I want to jump over here and look at the seal in Revelations. All right, coming, coming over here to Revelations chapter 7. We start to hear about this seal. Look at verse 2. It says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given not to hurt the earth or the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This is actually the same seal that we're talking about here in, in Hermas, is this seal that's about to be put on these, these individuals. Hmm. Re remember, we talked about this before, and I'm a strong believer in that this tower that we're building in, in the Shepherd of Hermas is actually the 144,000. The, these, these individuals that are, that are making up the tower are the 144,000. Because we're going to find out in a minute that the tower has to be completed before the purification of the earth. Yeah. Well, if you remember, it is only the 144,000 that will be united around the law before these tragic events start. There will be many people that will come afterwards that will want to be in the faith and want, you know, once they have their wake up call, they're going to want to be obedient to the scripture then. But in now's time, when we're in this time of peace, this, this time of plenty, there's nobody even thinking about the law or the commandments or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so it is this tower that it, that's being created now that's making up these 144,000 individuals. And it is this seal that we're talking about, you know, where it goes on to say uh, that each one of these uh, uh, members from the 12 different tribes are sealed, where you have uh, uh, that make up the 144,000. This is the tower that we're talking about here in Revelations Chapter seven. So, would that that would mean that of these twelve mountains, he's talking about um, the believers of the twelve mountains are the hundred and forty-four. Mm, you have to go even further than that because they. The Son of God is preached to all of the world. So the Son of God is preached to all different members of the 12 different mountains. But you remember, some of these mountains have black stones in them. Some of them have mildew stones in them. Some of these, some of these will not make it. So 
you can't really say that the that we have to just be careful when we say that you know there that the 144,000 are the believers of the 12 mountains because not all of the believers of the 12 mountains are going to end up in the tower. Right. There's only I mean there's a subset of them that's actually going to make it into the into the building of the tower. Mm -hmm. All right, you want to go on? Okay. 168. And therefore, the building of this tower appeared to be of the same color and did shine like the brightness of the sun. So, looking back at verse 177, it is this seal that they have received that makes them appear as though they had the same color and did shine like the brightness of the sun. Right? They all share the same faith and they all share the same charity. What does it say? That uh, same understanding and knowledge that makes them worthy of being in the tower. Same color, shining bright as the sun. Okay. Uh, my question is, okay, remember when the Lord of the tower came and struck the, struck the, um, the stones. Right. And some of them were thrown out and he told them to go and get some more stones from right. out of the plains. Mm -hmm. Who would they have been? These individuals are going to be the multitude of people. Now, those individuals that he got from the plane, those are simply the the people at the base of the 12th mountain. The kind of part of the 12th mountain. If you, if you just imagine that okay, you're going to build a mountain out of stones. Basically, all you're going to do is you're going to pour a big uh, or a bunch of rocks in one big place that's basically going to make a hill. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of going to be sloped off a little bit. Well, some of these that are down at the bottom of the mountain are, um, they're still part of the mountain. They're just not on the hill part. It's like they haven't risen up the hill. So, in relation to 144, uh, they would still be... You know, the ones that got put back into the tower, they would still be part of that mountain. Yeah. They wouldn't be, uh, you know, I think previously before we, we, you know, you got this revelation that we thought that they were like Gentiles grafted in or whatever. But, yeah. yeah. Well, that's what well, I Well, they all thinking. are. Yeah. Yeah. But they, uh, they're actually part of the mountain. They're just. Uh, at the bottom of the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain. Now, what it takes to ascend the mountain, I don't know if that's knowledge and understanding, faith, or, you know, something like that. You can imagine that's what it takes to be up in an elevated position on this mountain. Whereas these guys below, you know, they're, remember, they're going to be white and square. I mean, white and round. Mm -hmm. So, which the round part means that they're not really, um, they're still worldly and they're not really adhering to the law and such. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. 169. But after that, they had thus agreed in one mind, there began to be one body of them all. Howbeit, some of them polluted themselves and were cast off from the kind of the righteous, and again returned to their former state and became even worse than they were before. Okay, now Stacy is reading from the hardcover book here. Um, we're looking at a free PDF that we found on the web, and so seems as though they one of these words may be a little bit different but I mean it's okay they both make sense mm -hmm. now the end what he's talking about okay this is the individuals being struck by the rod mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. they they at one point was allowed to be in the tower and we had answered this question one time before that you know um, some of the people were allowed to go into the tower without being uh, carried by the virgins um, basically it's during the early building stages of the tower where it seems as though the angels were overzealous and putting everybody in the tower and it was you know only in the later stages of it that um, they realized that they were you know some of these individuals being put in, into the tower who had not changed their colors and so they was going to eventually have to be rejected. Well, that's who he's talking about here. These individuals who were rejected are those that polluted themselves with the wicked women. They, the, the beautiful women, they found them to be more beautiful than the, uh, than the virgins. 
And so they took on stuff like hate and perfidiousness and lying and foolishness and different stuff like this. And so they're going to have to be rejected out of the tower. Mm -hmm. 170. How said I, were they worse who knew the Lord? He answered, If he who knows not the Lord liveth wickedly, the punishment of his wickedness attends him. Okay, so... This, this is where there's, you know, a little bit of confusion in the church because of what some people call the Paulinian doctrine, right? You have to remember that Paul was a self-proclaimed Gentile teacher, meaning he came up and said, look, I'm sent here to teach the Gentiles. You know, I'm not here to teach the Hebrews or the Jews. I'm here to teach Gentiles. And in doing so, what did he tell them? The first thing he told them was, don't act like Jews. Okay? And, and, and but the, thing, the problem is, is that the Israelites or the Jews or the Jews or the Hebrews, those who are of um, the, the ones who are Israelite, not necessarily the grafted in ones, because that's who he was talking about, the ones who were going to be grafted in. The ones who were, you know, um, what's the opposite of grafted in? Uh, natural born. They, the ones who were natural Israelites, they heard this message and they're still hearing this message. And even today, they're acting like Gentiles. Yeah. Based on the Paulinian doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, I've said it once before, and I, I believe Paul has gotten a lot of people in trouble with that. Yeah. Because, you know, and it ain't his fault. Because, like right. I said, the first thing he said was, I'm here to teach Gentiles. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I think, you know, it's an uh, uh, excuse. Uh, well, yeah, they're using Paul as an excuse. Saying Paul said this and Paul said that. Forgetting that Paul said, I'm here to teach Gentiles. You know, I'm here to teach the other guys. I'm here to teach the guys that are not going to adhere to the Sabbath day. That are not going to, you know, keep up with the commandments and the laws. I'm here to teach these guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But and so the ones who were supposed to be keeping up with the laws and the commandments, they dropped Moses and ran over there to Paul. And so here we are in 2019, rejected stones outside of the tower, basically trying to get back into this tower before it's completed, mm -hmm. having to put off a lot of this Paulinian doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us, um, we like because that's where we want it to be anyway. And so we just use Paul. Uh, as an excuse to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, if you, yeah, you're right. You use it as an excuse. Yeah. I heard this uh, one um, guy say on on his channel, he said that when we get a chance to meet Paul in the spirit, he's going to be like, we're like, well, why did you say this? Or why did you say that? Well, Paul was like, uh-uh, I'm not y'all excuse. Because mm -hmm. I said that I was here to preach to the Gentiles to show them the way and y'all took it upon y'all selves to, to act like to Gentiles. To grab that yeah. doctrine mm -hmm. and run with it. Right, yeah. right, right. 171. But he who has known the Lord ought to abstain together from all wickedness and more and more to be the servant of righteousness. Right. Talking about the people who at one point knew the Lord but continued in their wickedness. And and like we were talking about a few minutes ago, they were under the laws of Moses. They were under the covenant. But when they saw this Paulinian doctrine, they would rather be under the Gentilist doctrine. So they, I, I want to use the word backslid. They kind of got rid of some of, you know, some of the laws and the rules and stuff that they didn't like and that they didn't want to adhere to. You know, they wanted to take pictures. They wanted to break the Sabbath day. They wanted to eat um, unclean animals like the Gentiles do. They wanted to celebrate the pagan feasts like the Gentiles do. Well, these people will be punished more severely because they knew the truth at one point and they basically rejected it. Because, you know, they did, like you said, they just, they just wanted, they wanted to be like the Gentiles. They liked their stuff better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's basically it. 172. And does not he then seem to thee to sin more who ought to follow goodness, if he shall prefer the part of sin 
than he who offends without knowing the power of God? Remember that uh, the definition of a sin is a transgression of the law. That's right. what sin is, the transgression of the law. And so these people who know the Father and know the truth have basically transgressed the law because they, you know, preferred, you know, to be in that state. And doesn't it seem that they are... Uh, will be punished more severely. Mm -hmm. well, the, one, one analogy, you can think of it as, you know, a, a parent with natural born children and foster children. The, the natural born child has been there and heard all of the rules, they know the family rules, they've been a member of this family all of their life, and then all of a sudden you bring in some foster children. Well, of course you don't tell the foster children all of the rules, all of the family rules, you know, and so you, you, they, they are more liberal in the things that they're allowed to do. Mm -hmm. So then you have the natural born children who look at the foster children are like, you know what, I'd rather be like them. They get to stay up later. They get to, you know, they don't have to uh, wear tassels all the time or they don't have to, you know, do all of the things that we have to do. And so they put off the rules of the natural born and take on the rules of the foster children and start acting like foster children. So when the parents come home, you know, and see these children acting in this kind of manner, who's going to be in more trouble? Right. The foster children or the natural children? Right, the natural children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wherefore, these are indeed ordained unto death, but they who have known the Lord and have seen his wonderful works if they shall live wickedly, they shall be doubly punished and shall die forever. With that, with that, I'm thinking about, you know, just think about the um, the Hebrew culture and all. We have not, we knew the, we were given the statutes, the laws, and the commandments, and um, we just blatantly just diso became disobedient and seemed like the wickedness is on us. Well, the punishment is on us more so than, than the, uh, any other other nation. Yeah, yeah. you know, the, the punishments of Leviticus 26 seem to apply to us more severely than any other group. Well, when you're looking right here, what in 173, it says, If they shall live wickedly, shall, they shall be doubly punished and shall die forever. Now, looking back up the end of 172, it's talking about those individuals who never knew the power of God. In 173, it says they are indeed ordained to death, too. They're going to die, too. Mm -hmm. You know, you, whether you're a Gentile or Hebrew, you have to be under the power of God. You have to be under the commands and the covenant. You have to obey the rules. But, you know, so, you know, anybody who doesn't will, will is subject to death. But, you know, like you said, the ones who are natural born, the ones who have known the power of the Father, who know the Father, they're just going to get a double dose of this punishment. They're going to get twice as much. Yeah, and you know, uh, just for everyone, anyone who's listening that haven't um, listened to um, Coach's uh, video, uh, Black Lives Doesn't Matter, he talks a lot about, you know, a lot about this. Yeah, you know, because... Um, and, and that's a little bit, we don't, we don't touch um, too much on the bloodline Israel. I mean, we understand, you know, that, you know, who these people are and what their roles are in the end times. But our channel is more geared to everybody. You know, right. That's why, you know, we, we teach a message for, you know, all, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, what you look like. Right. Um, but you do have to understand that these people have a different kind of requirement on them mm -hmm. they 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 do have a a um a responsibility right. more than others and so they are punished more than others yeah this I is think, why they huh? i was gonna say i think that's the word responsibility not saying that you know they're better better but they do have a responsibility that they were given 
And so, yeah. And so this is why they're being, this is why they were put in slavery. Mm -hmm. This is why, you, this is why they're now debating whether their lives matter at all. You know, you know, you know, and there's a lot of people that are standing up and say, no, their lives don't matter. We can kill them and do whatever we want. It's you because know? of this punishment. It's because they are outside of the scripture. Like we say in that video, they, they have put away uh, their father and taken on the father of the Gentiles. Right. Mm -hmm. 174 as therefore thou hast seen that after the stones were cast out of the tower which had been rejected they were delivered to wicked and cruel spirits and thou beheldest the tower so clean as if it had been made of one stone so these individuals who 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 preferred the beautiful women who you know ran back over to these deceitful women? They are cast. They are first of all rejected out of the tower. At one point, they were inside the tower. They were kicked out of the tower, and then some of them were thrown far away from the tower. And, and you know, the tower was basically swept and cleaned while they were carried off back to a back to where they came and put in a more uh, into a worse state than when they started off. You know, they're more angry now. They tell more lies now. They're more adulterous. You know, they, they do more foolish stuff than they've ever done before. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine how this is going to play out in the tribulation when these people are acting worse than they've ever. They've never been that mean before. They've, you know, looking over some of these, you know, uh, uh, some of these different traits over here. Um, they've, they've never been so malicious. They might have had a little bit of maliciousness in their heart that they didn't want to get rid of. Well, during the hottest part of the tribulation, they're going to be really, really malicious. Well, this reminds me of when the Messiah said that how uh, once the evil spirit is away from you, he looks and um, to see it clean and then he takes on a lot more spirits than he had previously. So, uh, that's that's basically what they're doing. They're becoming um, uh, more hostile, uh, or you know, otherwise you see a nice person. You, now they're angry all the time. That's right, know, like, like that. Okay, one seventy-five. So the church of God, when it shall be purified, the wicked and counterfeits, the mischievous and doubtful, and all that have behaved themselves wickedly in it and committed diverse kinds of sin. Being cast out shall become one body, and there shall be one understanding, one opinion, one faith, and the same charity. All right. So that's what the purification is going to be of. You know, that's, you know, we did a class on the purification of the earth. This is what's going to help cleanse this tower and clean this tower is this purification. And you see here the ones that's actually going to be. Uh, uh, taken away, and you know, um, you see that you see that the breed is going to be cleaned up. Wicked, counterfeit, mischievous, doubtful, um, and and you know, these individuals will be swept away from the tower, and they won't be a part of the tower. One seventy six, and then shall the Son of God rejoice among them, and shall receive his people with a pure will. Yeah, this is the this is the tower. The, the tower will be cleaned before, or the tower will be complete before the purification, meaning before the seventh trumpet blows, there, there will, the tower will be complete. You know, that's, that's the end of this tower. When that seventh trumpet blows, that's when we have the uh, second coming for all of the world, that moment that everybody's going to see. Everybody, you know, basically everybody's going to be changed, you know, you know, a lot of people call it the rapture or whatever. Well, um, when that moment comes and we are changed in a, in a moment. That's it, when the tower is going to be. That's that the tower will be completed at that time. And so then we have the second coming of the father who comes down and rejoices with the members that are in the tower and they go forward to live in what's called the kingdom age or the millennial age or the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. 177. And I said, Sir, all these things are great and honorable, but now show unto me 
the effect and force of every mountain, that every soul which trusts in the Lord, when it shall hear these things, may honor his great and wonderful and holy name. All right, so now he's going to go on to explain the individuals uh, that make up these mountains. And here again, what you know, well, like we said before, we have to find ourselves in these mountains. We have to do our due diligence to identify ourselves in the mountains and not be quick to say that we are on, you know, the good mountains. You know, everybody's going to want to say, yeah, I'm on mountain number 12 or I'm on mountain number 8, which is, you know, the good mountains. Because, you know, a lot of us are not. That's why we're still in this rejected state. That's why we are given a chance to, to correct ourselves. It's because we are now rejected stones. Yeah, and if you continue to think that you're the good mountain, then you're not going to do the work to try to better yourself. And, you know, because there's a possibility and 90% chance that you're not, you know, that yeah, none of us are. Yeah, that good mountain. So, you know, don't settle for the state that I'm the good mountain and then you don't do no work. There's things that you can be doing now because, as Coach said, once the tower is finished, it's finished. Yeah, and, you know, you, 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 what will happen is you say, well, through our arrogance or our pride, you know, um, we'll say, you know, I'm good. I don't have to worry about anything like that. But then once the hottest part of this tribulation come and we find that we have not walked with these virgins as we should have, then it's going to get really, really hard on us as these wicked women come and grab us and try to drag us back to hate land, try to drag us back to, you know, uh, malicious land. You know, it's going to be really, really tough. But if we can, as early as possible, identify ourselves on these uh, not so good mountains, we can start to make corrections right. and start to figure out, you know, I have cracks, I have chips, mm -hmm. you know, in my, in, in my mountain, I need to get rid of these chips, mm -hmm. you know, all right, but before we do, before we get into these mountains, I want to come and try to find this part, I want to come and show where the tower is actually written at in Revelations, okay, all right, look in here in Revelations, what is this? All right, looking here in Revelations chapter 21, we can see where the tower is actually written about in Revelations. So we've already seen about, we've already talked about this seal, mm -hmm. but in here we can see, um, we can see where the tower is written at. Okay, I'm interested in seeing this. All right, well, let's go through it. All right, see in verse 1, he's talking about a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there were no more sea. Mm -hmm. Now... <laughs> There's a lot going on in that verse right there, right? But when he says no more sea, are you prepared to hear how people are not going to die anymore? That's what they're saying right there, no more sea. Remember the, the, the abyss where people will come? I, I ain't going to take the time to explain it, but that's what he's saying right there. And he's talking about this new heaven and this new earth. This is the, this is the new Jerusalem that he's talking about. Right here, you see that in verse 2. He saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared for the bot, for the bride adorned and for her husband. That's the kingdom of heaven that he's talking about right there. That's mm -hmm. the millennial age. Okay, I can understand that. Look right here in verse 3 where he's talking about, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. That's talking about how we're all going to have his temple inside of us. We're going to recognize the Father being inside of us, where he's going to dwell inside of us. Mm-hmm. And that's why it means by, and God himself will be with them and shall be their God. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 4. Again, he's saying that there's no more death. You know, mm -hmm. we don't die anymore. Mm -hmm. The same way people in, in older times live for a thousand years, that's going to happen again here. No more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. This is the change that we're expecting to go through. This is one of the elements of the change is that, you know, there is no more death. You know, there is no more crying. You know, people start, what it boils down into is that we understand where this pain comes from. We start to, whereas now it seems like, you know, things just going bad for us. Right. Later on, we're going to realize, no, you know, everything works for good for those who love the Father. Right. All right, verse 5, he's telling them to write this to those who are true and faithful. So he's basically telling them to write this part for the, for the elect, for those that are in the tower. All right, verse 6, he's going to start, he's, he's getting ready to start explaining this tower. Verse 7, he's talking about how those who overcome, those who make it through the purification process. 
Verse 80 is telling you who are not going to make up the elements of the tower. Those that, you know, ain't going to be in the tower, right? Fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. These individuals are going to find themselves in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, talking about their stuff that's going to come out of the sky when we read in the first trumpet blast and the seventh seal and all of that. You know, that's fire and brimstone, that fire mingled with blood. These individuals who are outside of the tower, that's how they're going to be swept away. That's the sweeping away process is when they find themselves in that fire and brimstone. All right, you have the, in verse 9, you have the seven angels with the seven vials. These individuals are going to show him the bride. And who are the bride? Everywhere you read, everywhere you read in the scripture, the bride is the 144,000. Mm -hmm. These are the elect, right? These are the chosen. All right, now see right here where the spirit carried him up onto a, a great high mountain. This is similar to Hermes. Mm -hmm. He's basically showing him the same kind of vision, except the wording is different here. But this is the same thing where he takes him up on a mountain and starts showing him this tower. Starts showing him, you know, the, the, the end time scenario. Shows him the what this what this tower actually looks like. Hermes uses words like white, but over here it looks like they're they're uh they have the the uh you can see more of what this color actually looks like. Yeah, and the thing that pops out to me it says, And her light was like unto the stone most precious even than the Jasper stone, even as crystal, and we know that the tower is the church, so All right, now look right here in verse twelve, he starts talking about the wall, great and high. Mm -hmm and had 12 gates and at the gates the 12 angels and the names written which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel this is the tower here now why does it have 12 gates well the first thing that jumps to my mind is the 12 apostles these individuals would have acted as sort of kind of gates there you got the main gate you know which is uh, the Messiah but these other individuals would be gates as well because, remember, they, they went down into uh, Hades and brought some of these people in as well. But, you know, so that there's a little bit of the, little bit of Bible study to go on there. Some, you know, we're waiting for some revelations there. But look there, you have the 12 angels. Right. Who are the 12 angels? Uh, and a great wall and high and had 12 gates. And at the gates, the 12 angels names written thereof which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel so the 12 angels represent the 12 virgins right and it says and the names written therein which are the uh, names of the 12 tribes of the church these are these 12 mountains here which he's talking oh. about right there which are the 12 yeah those are the 12 mountains there which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel yeah and when we're when we talk about 12 tribes of the children of Israel, we're talking about the 12, uh, uh, not Reuben, Simeon, we're not talking about that, we're talking about, we're talking about those 12 mountains, 12 mountains, the, the different kinds of believers, right, yeah. right, and look right here, verse 13, uh, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the uh, west three gates. That reminds you of those 12 virtues who had, you know, there was four of them standing at each corner. Mm -hmm. But then in between them were three, were two other mm -hmm. virgins. Two mm -hmm. virgins were standing between them. Mm -hmm. Now, right here, look at verse uh, 15 where he's getting ready to measure. He says he was given a reed like unto a rod and told to measure the city. And the gate thereof and the wall thereof. Look at 16. First thing you notice is that the tower is made on a square. Right there, the length was four square. This means that the tower is built on, I mean, the thing that he's measuring is built on a square. And there's that number again, 12,000 furlongs. And the length and the breadth and the height are equal, meaning that it's kind of a cube. This tower is kind of like a cube if, if the all, if, if, you know, the height, width, and the length are all the same, which it says right there, the, the tower is actually going to be built into a cube. Mm -hmm. Let's verse 17. It, look at verse 17 when he actually starts to measure this thing. He measured the wall thereof and 144 and 4 cubits. One, 144. Mm. Wow. 
All right, and then he goes on to tell them that the building of the wall was of jasper and the city was pure gold like in the clear glass. He tells them what the foundation looked like, garnished with all manner of precious stones. It's talking about those first individuals mm -hmm. that went into the tower. Jasper, sapphire, uh, and so forth. Now, look down here in verse 22. He says, the temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So inside of the tower, you're going to have the temple. And that's what we're expecting in the kingdom of heaven is that these people will have the temple of the father inside, basically providing a, a kingship for everybody on the planet going after the tribulation. Now, verse 23 could be a little bit tricky when it talks about there's no no sun, neither moon to shine in it. This is you remember what that's equivalent to in the scripture. That's talking about those pagan gods there. The the sun represents the gods that they celebrate on Christmas, and the moon represents those gods that they celebrate on Easter. A lot of people don't know that. We have to study, you know, that Babylonian stuff, but, you know, that's what's going on. Sun god worship and moon god worship, where the, the sun represents the male and the moon represents the female. There will be no more of that because, you know, people are not going to lead that, need that. Right. Right there, right there in verse 24, he says... And the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor to it, meaning that we're all going to worship the Father going forth. And looking all the way down there at verse 27, he says, And there shall be, uh, and there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever work of abomination or make up a lie. This is talking about the kingdom age. This is talking about the tower. There is your tower, Hermes' tower, written right there in Revelation. I think so too. Uh, uh yeah, from I mean, the description of Revelation to the descriptions that we got here, not word for word, but, you know, uh, a lot of things in Revelations were said that were not said here in Hermas. Um, well, you have to understand. It, it makes sense to me. Well, you have to understand what's all going on here. You have individuals who are seeing visions. And then having to go and write that stuff right. down. And so, you know, they, they you know. John would have understood things a little bit differently than what Hermes would have, mm -hmm. but neither one of them understood, you know, what they were looking at. They were just seeing a vision and kind of just writing stuff down, you know, and so it kind of looked different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Giving all praises to our Father in heaven, from whom all blessings flow. That's going to wrap it up for this particular show. We're hoping that you like what you've seen, and so push that button. Um, if you look up in these end screens, you might find another one that'll uh, um, look pretty interesting. Uh, maybe you'll take a look.